Nim Sony. Welcome back to part 2 of our tutorial series. We're going through inputs in these videos, so let's have a look at the game again. Let's go! Let's get straight into it. We have a cube in the centre of our screen when we press play. We have our inputs moving left and right for the cube. Right. What we're going to do today, instead of looking at the code as just one line directly, we're going to create a new vector because we want up, down, left and right. Uh, we're going to create a two axis vector and actually store our input before we apply it to the cube. Let's have a look before we do that in the inputs panel again and make sure that our horizontal and our vertical both have our gravity and sensitivity set really really high so that they jump straight to one or uh, negative one without going through all that interpolation rubbish. So that's set. Let's get back to our code. Now, what we want to do here is actually create a vector 3, uh, no, vector 2, because we have two axes for our input, up, down, left, right. And let's call it input. Pretty useful. Now, before we do our position code, we need to get our inputs. So let's say input equals, and we're going to get use the exact same code that we had here. So input.get axis, except we're going to create a new vector. So here, new vector2, open the brackets, input.getAxis, and we use horizontal first because that's our x-axis, and then, I'm just going to copy it to save some time, comma, that gives us our y-axis, we do the same thing, except we do it with the vertical axis. We've now successfully got inputs. Let's have a look what that does. So instead of, of course, applying input directly to our transform position, we're going to apply our vector, which of course is called input. Now in each of these, remember we've got a vector 2 for input and a vector 3 for position. So we have to create a new vector 3 so that we can work with the correct axes. On the x-axis of our position, which is of course this axis here going left and right, we set our x input. On the y-axis, we're going to set our vertical position. So that's input.y. This is not what you'd normally do because y is normally the height. You're normally applying input to the x and z values of your position. But for now, we're going to do this because we're going to look at something that we've done here that's actually a little bit wrong for keyboard input specifically. Now you may have noticed a short cut there. It was actually because I connected my joystick. I forgot about that part. Let's play the game and see when I press up, it goes up, down, goes down, left, goes left, right, goes right. Of course, that works brilliantly. Now, the problem is, I'm going to add a cube behind this cube. Let's place a cube here behind. So we'll go one back in the Z, and I'm gonna scale this up to three, three. In fact, we're gonna need a few materials just to make, uh, make things a bit visible. So I'm just gonna make a new folder here materials, add a new material. I noticed actually that the background here was actually glowing in the video. That's nothing to do with my settings or anything. That's actually YouTube. It wasn't looking like that in the video source files. It wasn't looking like that in the exported video files. But as soon as it got to YouTube, boom, everything fails. So I'm going to set our cube so that it's this material, which of course I'm going to set to a color. There we go. Now you'll notice the problem when I press up. There we go. Down, left, right. Corners, however, go all the way to the edges. Now that's very weird because what you'd expect is a perfect circle. If I add a sphere now, in the exact same position is the other one. And I'm going to set him to a 3 and 3. Then we can see here the sphere. I'm going to remove that second cube and see you can see here when I press up, it goes exactly to the edges, down, left, right. But when I go diagonally, it goes right beyond that point. That's because we're not moving in a perfect circle. In fact, we're moving in a square because we have one and then one on the left and up as well. And as a result, we end up with a diagonal that's more than one. That's too much. That's beyond the limit of input. Let's fix that now before we even apply anything to movement. Pop over to your script and what we're going to do with the input 
is we're actually going to clamp it. So input equals input, oh no, vector2 dot clamp magnitude. And then we're clamping input to one. Brilliant. Save it, switch back over. Now you'll notice a very weird thing is that now we have this sort of end part. It sort of moves diagonally now on the diagonals. The distance between the center and the end is always exactly one uh, as a max. That happens as well when I sort of move it around with an analog stick here and you can see it makes a perfect circle as opposed to making those squares. Now we have proper inputs what we can do as well now is start applying it in the form of a movement but let's change our axes around so that we're working on a sort of flow rather than in air. Switch back over to here we're going to do a bit of work we're going to delete that sphere there's no need for him and go over to your scene. We want a new ground. There we go. A new cube is added. We'll put him down minus one and scale him up to 20 on the X and 20 on the Z. That gives us a nice ground floor. We're going to need to move the camera up because he's looking right down here. So we'll move him up by about four. And of course we need to angle him down by about, let's say 20 degrees. That's about right. Now then, as you can see when we play the game our cube is moving up and down and it's actually going through the ground as you can see when I analog move which is kind of useless because we don't want him to do that we want him to move in the Z axis not the Y so switch back over to the cord grab this and zero that and now move it to the end as you can see now he moves forward and back and left and right. Brilliant. What we want to do now is change our code so that it's moving the cube. All we have to do is add an add. Brilliant. So now what we're doing, rather than setting our position to our input, which sets it to x0, 1, minus 1, whatever, and z0, 1, minus 1, whatever, on the vertical axis, instead we add a plus and now we're adding to that position. As a result, we end up with movement. Save that and see what happens. Now we're going to have an object moving really, really quickly now. As you can see, he's just flying about. Of course, I have an analog stick, so I can control that very slightly. We can move him slowly. We can move him very quickly. We can move him really, really sneakily. Yep, there we go. So as you can see, we have moving systems now switch over to here and we're going to understand now very quickly as the last part of this video we're going to understand something called time delta time what we want to do to our movement remember that our update function is actually running once per frame now i'm running on a gtx 1080 with a completely super simple scene of one cube and another cube one cube moving on top of the other that's literally it this is graphically nowhere near intense so as a result, you're going to get a very high frame rate, probably clamped off to about 200 or 300 frames per second, which means this cube is now moving by that input once every frame and therefore about 300 times a second. 300 times a second, that's going to be moving really, really fast, smooth, but really quickly. How do we control that so that the character moves always at the same speed, regardless of our frame rate? Well, we have to consider how long each frame takes. So multiply this by something called time dot delta time. Now, what does delta time mean? Delta in maths, we use as a word to mean change. So in this case, it's delta of time, changing time. In other cases, we could say a velocity is a change of position. Therefore, a delta of position, an acceleration is a change of velocity. Therefore, an acceleration is a delta of velocity. Here we're using delta time. How much time has moved since the last frame? As a result, we're multiplying by the amount of time changed in this frame. That is going to get shorter if you've, got, if you've got more frames per second. It's going to get longer if you've got less frames per second. As a result, you end up with the correct speed of movement. 
So what we end up with here, we're going to save it and we're going to get some really slow movement now. We press play and here we've got a full speed of one per second. One unit per second. Very, very slow. And of course now that is frame rate independent. It doesn't matter how quick our frames are or how slow our computer is running. We're still going to get the same character movement speed per second in real world. Switch back over and we can change that of course by multiplying it by let's say 5. And of course now we can control the movement speed as well. And this is perfectly perfect because it considers the frame rate as well. We can com still control it using the analog nice and slow. But in the end it's always going to move at exactly 5 units per second because we've made it move at 5 units per second. We've multiplied it by time, delta time, and then multiplied it by 5. That's the end of this video. We're going to explain in the next video how we can take that and actually make it into a useful system. And then, of course, after that, we're going to work with physics. See you in the next video. Goodbye.